One question that often comes up, usually in the form of a request, is to make a video about my design process. So in this video, I'll take you through that procedure from a roughly sketched idea to the thrown and trimmed object. Spin. Often, over my lunch times, I'll sit and sketch with no clear idea in mind until I see a particular shape that grabs my attention, and in this case, it was the pouring bowls on this page, which I wanted to try and recreate. In no way is this a new idea, but it's a form I've never made before in my range of pots. So, I wanted to make one that was a bit more angular in nature, to be more aesthetically in line with the rest of my work. I want their shapes to be wide and open, with a base that comes to a relatively narrow point. Somewhere, about halfway up, the shape will change, sloping either inward or outward. Then, the topmost section will have a pouring lip pulled in the rim, which I can already foresee being an issue, as a spout pulled on such a thin, wide form will definitely distort it. And this top wall of the pot needs to be thin, as I won't really be able to trim it due to the protruding spout. But I think this is the shape I like the most, and I'm sure I won't nail it the first time round, as it always takes a number of tries to get something right, and to troubleshoot any issues. I have stacks of drawings like this, some more carefully done than others, but they're a brilliant resource for inspiration if I'm having a day where I don't know particularly what to make. Whenever I post drawings like this, I generally receive a number of messages and emails asking if I make prints of these, and the good news is there will be some available soon, and I'll be making an announcement on my Instagram soon about when and where they'll be available. So let's begin. I often slam my bags of clay on the ground, flattening the bottom of the bag so they stand up nicely on the tabletop. The reason I didn't do it on the table is that to my right are a few boards of freshly trimmed pots, and slamming the table really hard will cause the pots to shake and move around, which can potentially mark the bottoms of the pots. I'll be throwing these bowls from roughly one and a half pounds to two pounds, or about 380 grams to about 900 grams. Although this clay taken directly from the bag is more or less free of any air pockets, it's really worth amalgamating all the weighed out chunks that make up each lump. I'm not so much getting rid of the air, as I am making sure that the texture throughout these is completely even. As I won't be trimming the upper sections of these pots very much, they need to be thrown very thinly, and that would make removing them from the wheel once thrown only using my hands quite difficult. So I'll be throwing them on these small MDF bats, this way, once they've been thrown, I can just lift away the platform they've been made on. I dampen the wood slightly, this way the clay really sticks to it. The first task, like it is with all pots thrown on the wheel, is to centre the lump of clay so that it's spinning perfectly in the middle of the wheel. If you try and throw a pot from a lump of clay that's wobbling and undulating as it spins, then you'll end up with an uneven pot, with the wall on one side being thicker or thinner than the other. The walls, being uneven, will make the entire process really difficult, as you're constantly having to readjust the pressure used with your hands as the pot is spinning around, rather than keeping them consistent. When I centre clay, I usually cone it up and down a number of times before pressing it into a shape like this. I watch my hands as they rest on the lump of clay, and when they're completely stationary with the clay spinning around quickly beneath them, then I know the lump is centred and I can move on to the next step which is creating an opening in this lump and forming the internal base of the pot, which I do by pushing the walls out with my fingertips. I don't want the base to be too thin, so I don't push down too much, as there's nothing worse than wiring the pot off the bat, only to realise that I didn't leave enough clay in the base and a hole is formed in the bottom. I can then begin lifting the walls of clay up, pinching in at the base and slowly moving my hands up. In this instance, I was using a wet sponge on the outside to do this, but more often than not, I normally use my knuckle to do more or less the same job, and you'll see that in some pulls coming up. The soaked sponge is useful, as I can push it in very firmly at the base, and as I do, water comes out of it, keeping the clay really hydrated, so nothing potentially sticks and then deforms, which can happen when you're using your knuckle very forcefully. Pulling up the walls like this can be a difficult process to describe, but essentially, on the inside, my fingers are pushing out just above the knuckle where the clay bulges out most, and my knuckle, on the outside, is actually lifting up that bump of clay. At this point, I want to begin angling the walls out, so I push out firmly from the inside, whilst my hand on the outside remains in place, bracing it, and keeping it from being pushed out too abruptly. With these pulls, I'm really just shaping the pot, rather than trying to gain any height out of it and with this movement you can sort of see the shape I'm aiming for. 
The next step is to refine this form, which I do by pushing the clay out against a sharp metal edge, which straightens the walls and removes much of the slip covering them. When I do this, I'm really pushing the clay out against the metal rather than digging the metal tool into the clay, as doing so is an easy way to quickly destroy the pot, especially when doing so near the rim where there's very little clay, like the base of the pot, supporting the walls. To tidy up the inside of the pot, I remove much of the excess slip and water and roughly scrape clean the walls so the throwing rings aren't too prominent. Next, excess clay is scraped away from around the base and as I'm doing this, I'm very careful to not allow too much clay to gather up on the tool. As if it does, that massive clay can push into the wall of the pot, deforming the lower section of the wall. I then create the spout and I apologize for my elbow getting in the way here, but later in this video, you'll see this same process from a number of much better angles. With the spout freshly pulled, I don't fuss around with it too much, as it's incredibly easy with the clay being so soft and so thin to simply deform it and ruin it. So if I do need to make an adjustment, I'll wait until the clay firms up. That way I can touch it without having to worry about destroying the pot. You may have noticed that I didn't wire this pot off, and the reason I didn't do it at this stage is again, simply to cause less disruption to the rim, as when you slide a wire underneath a pot, it often does cause the rim to move a tiny bit. So instead, I'll do it the following day when the pot is leather hard, thus negating any risk of distortion. With these next two bowls, I'll be showing you two different errors, both being very common when throwing on bats, and in both cases, I'll show you what I do to fix them. When I begin centering, I pinch right around the base of the lump of clay, pressing in my little finger to seal the lump of clay onto the MDF bat. The piece of clay is then forced up into a cone and then pushed back down again. And I do this a number of times as it aligns the particles that make up the clay body, thus making it more even, more plastic and easier to throw with. The stoneware clay I'm using here is relatively firm and in those cases, and with a shape I want to remain really stable throughout, I normally cone the clay up and down perhaps three or four times. And I can really feel the difference between the clay at this point compared to how it felt at the beginning when I first began to center it. To open the lump of clay up, I plunge my finger and thumb into the very center and then draw those digits back towards me, skimming them over the surface horizontally. If I feel like I've left too much depth in the base, I'll run my fingers from the middle to the outer edge a number of times whilst pushing down gently, shifting the excess clay from the base into the lower section of the walls. This puts it in the correct position and means I'll be able to utilize and throw with it rather than it being wasted in the base of the pot. I then collar the walls in and begin the pulling up process. And this is where the first fault happens. My digits that were doing the pulling dried out, sticking to the pot and causing it to pull off center. I should be able to rub the MDF bat back and forth a number of times to stick it back down. Yet the most difficult thing is getting the bat truly centered again. It doesn't need to be perfect. And as you can see here, it's not quite centered, but it's more or less good enough. I'll soak the walls and then clasp around them really firmly, forcing the clay back to being centered. In this case, that meant pushing the walls down slightly, but I'll easily be able to gain that height back. I steadily hold my hands and compress the walls, and once they feel like they're centered again, I can begin the pulling up process as per normal. This will be the pouring bowl I circled at the beginning, with a section of wall that slopes outward at the top. With the shape roughly there, I can begin refining the form. This consists of cleaning and straightening the walls, which I normally do from bottom to top. Excess clay is then scraped away from around the base. And I think with this form in particular, I would have preferred a base that was a bit more narrow but perhaps I can trim it back to my liking once leather hard. It can be quite difficult to replicate your drawings exactly when throwing pots on the wheel, hence why there's always a bit of trial and error. To pull the lip, I place my finger and thumb of my left hand on the outside walls of the bowl, and with the wetted index finger of my right hand, I flick at the rim between those two fingers, stretching the clay out and forming the pouring lip. 
I like this one already, and I like the wavering lines that encircle the pot, caused by the protruding spout. The wooden bat is then pried away with the pot on top of it, and I'll leave these to gradually dry out for the rest of the day. Okay, this time I really want the bat to stick down firmly, so I dampen the MDF and I splash some drops onto the clay bat. I rub the board back and forth before pushing down with almost all my weight to make sure it's really stuck. I then dampen the bat, and this is where my second error emerges. The clay is flung down firmly, but in this case, I left too much water on the bat, which, like you might have guessed, causes the lump of clay to hydroplane and move off center. I try to brute force it and seal the base, but it doesn't work. And so, if this happens to you, the easiest way to fix this is to scrape away all the slip from the bat and the lump of clay. And sometimes a plastic kidney isn't good enough, so I switch to a sharp metal one to remove as much slip as I could. I then slam the lump of clay down, really seal the bottom, and continue centering like normal. I push my finger and thumb down into the very centre, with my aim being to leave about 3 or 4 millimetres in the base. Although in hindsight, and the next time I make these, I'll throw all of them with about a centimetre in the base. This way I'll be able to trim a more elevated foot ring on all of them. It might not look like my hand on the inside is doing very much, but my fingertips, especially with my middle two fingers, are pushing out quite strongly to form the bulge my knuckle is lifting on the outside. And with each consecutive pull, the walls get thinner and taller. And with these bowls, I'm trying to leave quite soft throwing rings, as if they are too apparent they can actually interrupt the flow of liquid when it comes to using these. Finishing the outside is next, and for this pouring bowl, I wanted the top section to be straight. All the excess water is scooped out from the inside, and it's often also a moment I can quickly tidy up the wheel. The inside is then lightly gone over with a metal kidney, the rim smoothed over with a chamois leather, and I'm pinching lightly so that the rim comes to a sharp beveled edge. The last remnants of slip are scraped off the outside. This way my fingertips that will go on the outside wall don't stick to this portion of the pot. I brace the wall with my left hand, and with a wetted finger, the spout is formed between them. I try to keep my fingertip away from the edge of the lip, as if I brush my nail over the delicate spout, it can leave you with a rather messy finish. So it's really just the length of my finger that's doing the work, not the fingertip itself. I think they work. I like their angular nature, but I won't have an idea of how it affects how well they pour until they've been fired, as if I filled these up with water now and tried to pour it out, the pots would simply collapse, as the clay would be really oversaturated. I ended up making a fourth bowl, with the top section that angles in before angling outward, which is more akin to some of the vase forms I make, and I think this, out of all of them, will probably be the one that pours worst, as on the inside there's actually a bump before the spout. But, like I've said before, this first batch of bowls is really just a trial run, and I'm sure when I make them for a second, and for a third time, and glaze and fire them, I'll know which shapes I prefer and which to avoid in the future. Before I go home for the evening, I'll very carefully just pinch either side of the spout so they keep a defined shape, as these pulled spouts will loosen as they dry. So before I go home, and probably the following morning, I'll check the spouts so they remain to my liking. As they are still quite soft, I can't just sling plastic over them, so instead I build a makeshift damp cupboard over them. I use kiln props, a large sheet of polystyrene, and five or six sheets of dry cleaners plastic. With these I build a tent around them, which will prevent airflow around the pots, which could potentially dry them out too much overnight. I was also firing my electric kiln, which fires automatically by itself overnight. This would have likely dried the pots out way too much, so at least by covering them, I'm still in control of the drying process, even if it did slow down their drying somewhat. 
The rims of each of these pourers is more or less leather hard now, so I'll pinch on either side of the spout to define its shape and brush away any burrs of clay that remain on the lip. In some cases I pressed on the outside of the bowl to push it back into a more circular shape. As for the very slight indentations you can see either side of the spout, I don't worry about those, as the glazes I'll ultimately be using will completely hide them. To wire these pots off, I push my knee against the bat on the table. This holds it in place as I glide a really taut wire underneath the pot, separating the bowl from the wooden bat. And lastly, all the clay left over on these bats is scraped away. And for all the dry burrs that inevitably get knocked onto the table during this process, I use the soft, scraped away clay to pick all of these up, and I immediately chuck all of it straight into the reclaim bucket. Trimming comes next, and I think this is where I learnt the most about this particular shape, and how I'll approach making these in the future. I carefully scraped away some of the clay from this top part, making sure I don't accidentally hit into the protruding spout. This was just to straighten up this top section of the wall. I could then trim the lower section, turning it back to have a narrower base, and removing some of the excess weight that resides in the bottom of pots. You may have seen that I interrupted the line beneath the spout, which I did by trimming through the undulation creating the spout adds to the pot. It's very difficult to avoid doing this, and I think in the future when I make more of these, I'll only trim the lower section of the pot and avoid refining anywhere near the spout whatsoever, which means at the throwing stage, it needs to be thrown to the shape of my liking and be very thin, perhaps even more so than I've already done with these. I then trim a beveled edge around the outside of the pot, trim the base to be nice and flat, and free of any marks left over from the wiring off process. I then use a smooth plastic kidney to bevel over these surfaces, as the base of the pot will be the only area that's free of any glaze. I always make sure to complete them with a relatively high degree of finish, so not scratched or indented, and I don't want there to be any burrs of clay stuck into the clay here, which means whichever surface I place this on hereafter, I'll make sure it's wiped clean of any specks of clay that might otherwise embed themselves into the base of the pot. Sadly, the other three bowls were still a bit too soft to trim, so everything was covered again overnight, and I'll finish those three bowls first thing the following morning. With one of these bowls I felt the rim had distorted a bit too much to my liking, so I secured it to the wheel with some slip and then held a rubber kidney in place as I span it, forcing the still relatively soft clay back into a circular shape. This was followed by some scraping on the outside, again just to straighten this portion of the pot and to remove the slight curve it had. When turning their undersides, I secure the bowl in place with a few lumps of soft clay. When I press these down onto the wheel, I don't push them horizontally into the bowl, as doing so would distort the thin rim of the bowl. So instead, I push them down vertically, and I let the clay that pushes out naturally to either side be the clay that holds the bowl in place. And this typically prevents the rim from being distorted when it's being secured. This shape was utterly impossible to pick up. I could have squeezed lower down on the vessel, near the rim where the spout is, but the clay was quite soft, and I felt like doing that may cause the pot to distort, but I got away with it eventually. I thought that this bowl may be the hardest to turn, 
but actually is there's a whole plane of clay separating the spout portion from the lower half of the vessel. This created some kind of boundary, but I did still overturn this pot, creating a more irregular line than I would have liked. Once trimmed, and once held in my hands, the pot still felt a bit bottom heavy, so I placed it back onto the wheel and trimmed away another layer of clay. As I already trimmed the base, the clay there was relatively thin, so I used a spinner on top to distribute the pressure I'm pushing down with to keep the pot pinned in place as it's turned, as if I use my fingertips that would be more focused on a particular point, I could very easily distort the bottom and cause it to bow inwards slightly, which I don't want. And lastly, the pouring bowl with the straight top, which once again I'm pinning in place with the spinner instead of sticking it down with slip. This isn't something I normally do, but actually it worked really well. This bowl was slightly different from the others as I left enough clay in the base to trim a foot well from, which is a very subtle decorative feature I rather like, as it creates some point of interest for the pot if it's ever flipped over or held. From the side like this you can see the uneven line beneath the spout on a number of these, and I'm pretty certain once glazed and fired it'll be barely noticeable, but it's something I'll eliminate entirely when I make these next. I'm happy with these regardless. There's something new, and a new shape is always exciting to make, especially as I'm trying to make it match the rest of the range of pots I already produce. So if you have made it this far, please do let me know which shape you like most. And I hope you like this video despite it being slightly different from those I usually make. If, in the future, you would also like to see more of the design work that goes into my pots, then leave me a comment and let me know. As for now though, thank you so much for taking the time to watch, and I'll see you next time.